Hi, so I'm Peter Taylor. I'm a postdoc at The Ohio State University. And, and one of the problems that I've really become interested in over the last couple of months is how do we perform an unsupervised search for parity violations in cosmological fields? And, and I've really been focusing on, on spectroscopic galaxy surveys. Uh, I should say that, that some of the results that I'll present today have been led by, by Matt Kragi, who is a collaborator at the University of Queensland. Okay, so how have people gone about searching for parity violations in spectroscopic galaxy surveys to date? So the idea is that we can imagine that for, for every quadruplet of galaxies, uh, each of those galaxies forms the vertex of a tetrahedron. And then the question is, do we have an equal number of left and right-handed tetrahedra? And if the answer to that question is no, then that means we have parity violation present in our data, at least up to our statistical uncertainties. And that's because there's no way I can take this left-handed tetrahedra on the left and, and rotate it and translate it into this tetrahedra on the right. So the reason that this is an interesting thing to think about now is, is just in the last couple of years, we've had two really high significance detections of parity violations in large-scale spectroscopic galaxy maps. So the first of these is by Oliver Philcox, who made a 2.9 sigma detection with BOSS data. And the second of these is by Jaiman Hu and, and collaborators, which made a 7.1 sigma detection. And then what I'm showing here in these plots, these are the parity odd modes of the four-point correlation function. So that contains all the information about these tetrahedra. Uh, so the, the distance of each of these data points uh, above or below zero is, is really telling us for a particular tetrahedral configuration, whether we have an over or under abundance of left versus right-handed tetrahedra. Uh, so the question they're really asking here is, are these data points consistent with zero? And the answer, now at least seems to be no. Although I think these are really groundbreaking analyses, I, I think they they do suffer, or the four-point approach does suffer uh, from, from two major shortcomings. So the first of these is that we're really only capturing information at what's called the four-point level. So we're looking at tetrahedra, four vertices, um, but actually any anhedra with, with more than four vertices contains information about parity. So we really are potentially throwing away uh, a lot of information. And then the second issue, I mean, potentially an issue, is, is with the uncertainty quantification. Uh, so remember a few slides ago, I showed you these plots and I said, we're really asking the question, are these data points consistent with, with zero? Uh, so the, the, the way we do that formally is we write down a chi-squared statistic, which is given by the, the distance of that parity odd four-point function uh, from zero, uh, quantified by some inverse covariance matrix. And these uh, four-point correlation functions, which I've written of zeta here, they really are very long data vectors. So, so what that means is that we, we really don't have enough high fidelity simulations to, to estimate this covariance uh, directly, or at least have an unbiased estimate of the inverse covariance. Uh, so what people have, have done, I mean, it's, it's possible to get around this with a few tricks, but, but really what people have done is, is relied on theory to, to compute this inverse covariance. Uh, and it looks something like this. So this is from, from Jaiman's paper. Um, just a couple of months ago. And, and what you can see is that there's quite a lot of off diagonal structure. The, the thing is quite complicated. And, and the problem is that if we get this covariance wrong, uh, then, then that means that we might underestimate our uncertainties and, and think we've detected parity violation uh, when it's not really there. So, so the other approach is, is rather than using theory uh, to compute this inverse covariance and, and just quantifying our significance directly with a, with a chi-squared statistic, uh, assuming everything is Gaussian. 
is, is rather we can write down this, this chi-squared statistic, uh, again using theory, and, and then compare this chi-squared statistic to the chi-squared statistic we get from a set of high fidelity simulations. Uh, so this is like a rank test. Uh, and this is the approach Oliver took in his paper. So here in blue, I'm showing you uh, the distribution of this chi-squared statistic uh, relative to the, the chi-squared statistic computed from data. Uh, so again, there, there's quite a high significance detection using this method. But, but the problem is whether, whether or not we do a, a rank test or we use the chi-squared statistic directly, uh, we're really relying on, on theory and simulations uh, quantifying our uncertainties accurately. Um, and if they don't, uh, then we may be underestimating our uncertainties and, and making a detection in the data when, when it really isn't there. So I propose a, a solution to both of these problems. And, and my solution is to perform an unsupervised search, which doesn't rely on theory or simulations. And, and the idea is I start with my spectroscopic galaxy survey, and then I divide it up into little tiny chunks. And I show you an example of one of these chunks here, and I call it X. And, and the idea is that you can imagine the, the, the intensity here, the colors, that just tells you the number of galaxies in that pixel. So I've got my, my chunk X, and then I can parity flip that image and give myself um, uh, another uh, data set, P of X. So, so the idea is that for every chunk, I have the image and the parity flipped galaxy map. Now for each of these pairs, X and P of X, I feed these through some network G, just a neural network. And then I train that net network to maximize this function f, which is defined as the difference of g of x minus g p of x. Now, the reason that this is a sensible thing to do is that if no parity violation is present in the data, then, then x and p of x are both equally likely. So that you can imagine that they can kind of like swap places in this equation. And what that means is if no parity violations are present in, in the data, the, the expected value of f is, is zero. And if I, am at, if I see deviations from the average value of f over my validation set being greater than zero, then, then that means I've detected parity violations. Yeah, so the idea is that, that I start out with this big survey, I divide it into chunks, I, I split the data into training and validation set, I, I train on the training set, and then I use the validation set to compute uh, the average value of f over the entire validation set, and then I bootstrap over the validation set uh, to quantify my uncertainties. And, and in this way, we can quantify uncertainty uh, without ever having to rely on, on simulations or theory. Okay, so in practice, uh, this is like a standard computer vision task. Uh, so I put galaxies into voxels or, or pixels uh, and then use a convolutional neural network uh, to, to actually um, compute F. Uh, but I'll talk a little bit more about this later. Okay, so I started in 2D. Uh, because that's that's a lot easier problem. So now rather than looking at parity violations, I'm looking at mirror asymmetry. And the way that I've generated some mirror asymmetry fields is I've taken a bunch of left and right-handed triangles. I've allowed them to, to rotate and, and I've allowed, also allowed them to translate. Uh, and then I put them down on the field. And then everywhere where I have a vertex, I, I add one to the value of that pixel. So if you like that the color in these plots kind of corresponds to the number of galaxies that, that I have in this 2D universe. And then I do this in two different ways. So uh, the, the first time I generate 50,000 of these things and I assu assume on average or, or by construction, I have a 1% overabundance on average of left-handed triangles versus right-handed triangles. And I show you an example of, of one of these fields on the left. And then on the right, I do the same thing, but now I say on average, I'm gonna have an equal number of left and, and right-handed triangles. So the question is, can I detect this mirror asymmetry uh, using the technique I described two slides ago? And, and the answer is yes. So what I'm showing here is the expected value of F. 
And, and remember, if that is different from zero, then that means that I've detected parity violation. And then I just bootstrap over the validation set. So I, I leave aside a validation set of a, of a thousand examples uh, and then bootstrap over that set and compute the mean uh, or the distribution of the means. And you can see that that's many sigma away from zero. Uh, so that means I detect mirror asymmetry uh, exactly as I expect because I put it in there. Uh, and then on the right, there's there's no mirror asymmetry. And, and you can see that, that this distribution is consistent with zero. I mean, it's actually a little bit skewed to the right, but I ran this test a few times um, and, and that is, is just a random effect. In any case, this, this detection is below the two sigma, uh, well, below a two sigma threshold. Okay, so the problem with using a CNN is that they're just really hard to train. Uh, they require a lot of training data and in our case, this is really problematic uh, because we only have one universe to train on. Uh, so something that I've been doing is rather than using a CNN is to use something called a scattering transform, which has a lot of similarities with the CNN, uh, but the idea is that the, the filters are pre-trained. So I'm showing you an example here of, of some of the, the filters uh, that, that we start out with in a scattering transform. So again, the, the scattering transform has, has a couple of advantages. The first is uh, the filters are predefined. So there's many fewer weights, which means we need a much smaller training set. Uh, the second advantage is there is rotational symmetry, which we also have present in the real universe. Uh, and then the third advantage is the scattering transform is naturally able uh, to capture parity violations on, on different scales. Uh, where with the CNN, you really do need a lot of uh, layers. You really do need a deep network uh, to detect these parity violations. And so when I use a, a scattering transform rather than a CNN, I can reduce the size of the training set by about a factor of 10. And, and so Matt Kragi, who is my collaborator in Australia, uh, had basically exactly the same idea, uh, but he took this even a step further. Uh, rather than just relying on, on the scattering transform filters or kernels, which I show up here, um, he used those to initialize a neural field and allowed that, that field uh, to train. Uh, so this captures many of the same advantages as the scattering transform, um, but, but it allows the, the filters um, to actually uh, capture the, the or much are much more capable of capturing the parity violation uh, in the data. Um, and the results are, are really impressive uh, for, for his neural fields. So what I'm showing here is a simulation with a thousand triangles uh, in the field. And if you use the, the scattering transform technique, um, he, he wasn't really able to detect parity violations, even though he put them in. Uh, but, but with the learned filters using this neural field, um, he was able to detect parity violations. Okay, so of course we, we really want to do this in 3D. Uh, so I am able in, in a few toy models to detect parity violation in 3D, um, but it's not quite ready or at the level that, that it needs to be uh, to detect parity violation in, in the real universe. Uh, so this is a, an ongoing project. Okay, so I think uh, I can leave it here. Um, so the ultimate goal is to be able to detect parity violation uh, without relying on, on simulations or theory. Uh, and that's because we're concerned that we might be underestimating our uh, error bars. So it still remains unclear uh, whether or not the universe is a large enough training set to actually be able to make a totally unsupervised detection. Uh, but nevertheless, the, the technique that I presented should still prove really useful. Uh, so the first advantage is even if we can't detect parity violation using the data itself, uh, we can still use the data to train an optimal estimator, which will capture the beyond four point information. And then the idea 
is, is we can take this optimal estimator, compute a, a single number statistic, that's like the F in my network, uh, and then we can use this just like a chi-squared, and then we can do a rank test against simulations. Um, but the point is that this should have more statistical power because we're extracting information beyond the four-point function. Another possible extension is, again, very similar idea uh, to what I just described with, with the rank test. Um, but now, rather than feeding in the entire data set, uh, we can just feed in the four or five whatever, some number of endpoint analyses. Um, and that's a much easier uh, network to train. Uh, and this should allow us to be able to go beyond the endpoint analysis uh, with ever, without ever having to write down these incredibly complicated covariances that, that we'd need to do the five and six point analysis. Uh, so with that, I think the, the future for this technique is, is really bright, uh, but there's still a lot of work to do. And I think I'll leave it there. So thanks very much for listening.